in this fast is a whole group of angels and uh, they are worship angels and uh, and just now when you're worshiping they were all over the place and the interesting thing is that this time uh, they're carrying uh, I'm synchronizing while I'm talking uh, they are also they are carrying all kinds of interesting instruments and uh, this was their message uh, for the 40 day fast uh, and it's in line with some of the messages we've been preaching and uh, of course there were instruments I could recognize simple instruments like harp but the harp is more sophisticated and uh, some carrying trumpets and uh, some kind uh, for first time I see instruments like a flute looking thing and then uh, other instruments like like a long thing and it's big here and then it make a different sound altogether almost like a trumpety flute sound mixture of the two and um, so the, the host of angels, and they're not just here, they just go to and fro, and on all those who are fasting, uh, oh, we have synchronized. All those who are fasting uh, in these 40 days, and those who are part of this move all over the place, in every country of the world, uh, uh, north, south, east, and west, throughout the whole planet Earth. And uh, these angels are ministering into your life. And during this 40 day fast, some of you are going to sometimes hear, uh, sometimes when you sleep, sometimes when you're awake, sometimes in between, and sometimes in the daytime, you're going to hear sometimes a certain tone or certain sounds that vibrate into your being. And these sounds are like changing your DNA. I explain about the changes and the impartations of the seven spirits of God that will change your DNA. And it changes you from inside because this year is a year of miracles and harvest. And uh, there are spiritual miracles, there are soul miracles, there are natural miracles, there are financial miracles, there are miracles in every realm. Remember, you reap three times what you did not reap before. And uh, so it's just an overflow of the reaping of God. And uh, these are uh, even tonight when we minister in all night and even when you're in the presence of God. And uh, you're going to see them. And some of them uh, will gather together and they will go to and fro, to and fro ministering and imparting all that is to be imparted in these 40 days. Amen. Special grow angels uh, came from the choir of God uh, that is there. So, uh, it's very fascinating, some of the things that the angels have been talking about. So, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, tonight we continue on the theme of the end time mysteries. End time mysteries. And um, so, we're going to look at the Bible. But uh, besides looking at the Bible, um, I, uh, these uh, things will open some mysteries. There are even now mysteries to the natural man and science and uh, in archaeology and uh, chemistry in physics in different dimensions too that uh, uh, will be explained and for the first time you see the whole picture and understand all the history of mankind uh, that the Lord has been showing uh, different things that He has been showing. Now firstly I uh, just bring something from the, I will always like to end with the Bible and uh, there are some things in the book of Enoch that I'm going to also quote on. But firstly, let me start off with, uh, let me start off with um, the uh, things that, that are occurring in history uh, here and there in the humankind. And so the first thing I'm going to show you is a little file that I have uh, put together and you can easily find all this information on the internet. And of course, most people have no explanation for these things. Uh, we're going to explain some things to you of, the, uh, uh, of what is occurring here. So let's have a file on um, historical coincidences. Historical co coincidences. You really probably read some of these things, coincidences on history. Uh, and of course, in the secular world and in the new, uh, in the uh, occultic movement, they explain it as reincarnation but we don't explain it that way. There is a different explanation for all those things. And uh, one is like coincidences of history. Uh, is this a maximum? Oh yeah, it is a maximum. Eh? Okay, yeah. So, like you all know the coincidence between Lincoln and Kennedy, right? You probably read about it. And uh, 
So, of course, their faces are there. Let's uh, look up some of the wordings here. Uh, there's alarming high number of connections between presidents Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy. Both men stood over six feet tall, studied law. They both suffered genetic disease, served in the military. Both the president died on a Friday. Both were shot in the head. Both the president were seated next to their wives during the shot that led to their assassination. Uh, Lincoln sat in box number seven in the theater. Kennedy wrote in a car number seven. And uh, so besides that, which I synchronize with uh, more details that I have here, uh, let me show the spot on, uh, okay, this is on the Kennedys. Uh, uh, both were elected in the House of Representatives. Uh, it's about 100 years apart. And uh, in the 46, which you mean, no? 1846, 1946, kind of, kind of thing. And uh, the number seven occurred to both of them. Uh, both presidents were elected in the presidency in 60, inaugurated in 61. Just 100 years apart. Both, were def both defeated an incumbent vice president for the presidency. And uh, Incumbent means the previous president. Both their vice president and successors were South Democrats named Johnson. <laughs> okay. Both Johnsons were born in 08. And uh, then both men were shot in the back of the head in the presence of their wives. And uh, both were shot on a Friday. Then there's a fourth connection. Lincoln was shot in Ford's theatre. Kennedy was shot in a Lincoln made by Ford. <laughs> Coincidences that almost looks impossible. Both John Wicks Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald were killed and never faced trials. Uh, and, uh, okay. Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy. Kennedy has a secretary named Lincoln. <laughs> Think about that coincidence. <laughs> right. so, um, so those are some of the things that are there. Uh, of course, there are, there are several other things more. Then we switch to the other page, uh, uh, this one. We switch back to this file here. Thank you. Uh, next one. OK, you heard the story of the double hero. Uh, a man who saved the same baby's life twice on an accident. That's very rare. 1930, a baby fell out the window, and Joseph Ficklock broke the, uh, broke the, broke the fall, broke the line. Uh, a year later, the same baby fell from the same window. The same John also broke the fall. Right. So, you know, coincidence or something there. Of course, you know, coincidence can be arranged by angels. But how do you explain Lincoln and Abraham 1? We're going to see the explanation tonight. Tonight we're going to review some mystery. When you understand these mysteries, you understand that uh, one of the things that I, I, I start giving to you is this. If everything came out of chaos and random, as the scientists say, these things cannot occur. But if everything has a plan and cause and effect within a box, then coincidence will increase. I'll show it and help you understand that. Yeah. So let's look at the next one. Connected strangers. In 1920, there happened to be only three passengers on a certain train ride. Introducing themselves, they found that one of the riders' last names was Bingham, one was Powell, and the last rider's name was Bingham Powell. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine riding on a train, you know? And uh, one is called Tan, one is called Lee, the other is Tan Lee, right? So that's to be interesting. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, death repeats itself. Uh, can we uh, go out after the picture? In 1975, a man riding on a moped was struck and killed by a taxi driver in Bermuda. One year later, his brother was driving the same moped, was struck and killed by the same taxi driver and the passenger riding the taxi driver was the same person a girl with the same name the details you can search on the internet so what is happening there okay i'll give you a clue it's resonance you see the same moped same taxi 
resonance. Okay, next one. I'll explain it more afterwards. I'll just give you little clues. Okay, this is an interesting one, Flying Doctor. These are they're all actors, not real pictures. Uh, Dor Dorothy Fletcher had a heart attack in 2003 on a flight. For most people, it's extremely lucky to have one doctor abroad a flight. But Fletcher had 15 come to a rescue because all the pa a lot of passengers were doctors headed to a cardiology conference. <laughs> she has a heart attack. 15, oh, 15 cardiologists came right, on the plane. How unusual is that? Because of that, they were able to keep her stable. I've got 15 cardiologists, all heart specialists, and she has a heart attack in front of them. Right, okay. So imagine when you have a doctor's conference. I was disturbing uh, you know, my daughter one day. I said, you know, when all the medical students were graduating as doctors, I, and I disturbed, I said, this is one time when the English expression, is there a doctor in the house? Might not apply, <laughs> you might say, you know, uh, is anyone who is not a doctor in this house? <laughs> kind of thing, everyone is a doctor. Uh, anyway, next one. Okay, third time is not a charm, okay. A lightning bolt killed a man when he was standing in his backyard in Tarento, Italy. Thirty years later, his son was standing in the same exact spot and was killed by a lightning bolt. Then in 1949, the man's grandson became the third man to die from being struck by lightning in the exact same spot. <laughs> okay, what's happening here? A resonance. Now, resonance can be positive, can be negative. Okay, now this one you all probably heard, twin brothers. They were separated at birth. Their adopting parents named them both James. Remember, they separated at birth, so no contact. But for some reason, they both called James. And uh, they both grew up with enforcement training. Actually, they became sheriffs. Both became sheriffs. Uh, they married a woman named Linda. They both had boys, one of whom was named James Allen. The other was named James Allen, we had extra L. What's happening here? They divorced their wives, Linda, and remarried, and the woman they both remarried was named Betty. They both had a dog, same name, Troy. The men were united after 40 years, and they were able to share the amazing coincidences and identical lives. Twins. What is that? What is causing that? What made them choose? Was it their DNA? Partially, because the DNA contained resonance. Resonance that I have a dog. Hmm. I mean, how many names can you have a dog? There's lots of names. But I feel like my dog should be called Troy. On the other side, the same feeling. They like the name Troy. How coincidental is that? There is something that is linking both. Obviously, something is is signaling into both brains a resonance that is linked to the DNA since both are twins. Next one. Uh, here is the thing. This, uh, in 1858, a man, uh, the picture is not so bad because it's all acting. A man was shot dead while playing poker as an act of vengeance. The other players found another player to take his place and play with the dead man $600. The player turned the 600 to 2,200. When the cops heard the word, they demanded the 600 be given to the next of kin of the deceased. So they checked, and they found out the next kin was the son of the deceased, who happened to be the player that replaced that person. And they didn't know. So, is it coincidence? Because that the son of the deceased hadn't seen the father for years and did not know of his death. Some attractive forces there, working. Next one. Okay, these are two accidents that happened. Exact cars and all that. In 202, two identical twin brothers were killed on the same road from two different accidents within two hours of each other. Same scenarios. Interesting. Resonance, negative type. Next one. On this uh, place, 
and a pro, uh, appropriate hangout. Three men were hanged in London at Greenberry Hill in 1911 for the murder of Sir Edmund Berry. The names of the people who were being hanged, the three of them were called Green, Berry and Hill. <laughs> <laughs> they were hung on Greenberry Hill. Now, remember, the hill was not named after them. The name was there before they were hanged. So, what's causing this effect? That's a, and here you see, there is a resonance in a name. That is why sometimes when an actor changes their name, or singer changes their name, they change the resonance. Remember what was the name of Cliff Richard before he was Cliff Richard? Uh, most of you forgot. He was not born with Cliff Richard. Eh? What was his name? Uh, anyway, the internet is less available for you. But this is talking about resonance in a name. It can be negative or positive. An interesting thing there. Next. Double hearts. 1975, twin brothers, both living in Great Britain, were rushed to separate hospitals for heart pain. They're twin brothers again. They both had heart pain at the same time, and they didn't know it. Both died shortly after arriving to the hospital for heart attack. Both brothers were unaware of the other brother's illness. Twins die, same time. Resonance. Powerful. There's a dimension of resonance. Okay, next. This one you probably heard before, dodging the bullet. In 1883, a man shot Henry Zigland, his sister's ex-boyfriend, who he blamed for her suicide. After the shot, the man turned the gun on himself, thinking that Zigland was dead and shot himself. However, Zigland had not been killed. The bullet grazed his face, ended up in a tree. Later, Zigland went to go chop down the tree many, many, many years later, decades later. And because the tree was very hard to chop, he used uh, uh, dynamite to blow the tree. When the dynamite blew the tree, the bullet that was still inside the tree came and hit him on the forehead and he died. Same bullet. It was aimed aim at him. Finally got him killed. Interesting. And, and, and there was this thing that when I was staying, uh, you know, in the early days when I came to Singapore, I stayed in a room. So I had been staying in Aungang, one room. Then I stayed in um, uh, Bedo, in uh, one room provided. And then later it was Clementi before we went to various places before uh, my present apartment. So, so the, 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 uh, my host who's there in Bedo, uh, it happened that one day we saw the news, and the news was, I think here in Singapore, uh, we got one place uh, that very few trees, and then, and then some sort of freak storm or something, that one tree knocked the person and killed that one person. And then he say, so when I was in the car, we heard say, strange, huh? I say, that one tree waiting to kill just one person when he fall down. <laughs> he say, there is no coincidence. A lot of resonance is taking place that you never knew. So let's go on to the next one. Family Christmas. This is a funny one. In 1994, a pair of twins decided to make a last minute decision to drive to each other twins again. They drive to each other's house to deliver Christmas present. The two twins, they hit one another in an accident. So they both end up spending Christmas in a hospital. Coincidentally, their father was also in the same hospital, recovering from a surgery. So they had Christmas, all three of them in the hospital. <laughs> the father and the twins. Okay. Uh, then you know about Mark Twain. He, he was born the same year of Halley's Comet. And he instead commented that he, he would die when Halley's Comet come. And indeed, when Halley's Comet come and go, uh, he passed away on April 21st, one day after Halley's Comet returned. So it looks like his life was tied to Halley's Comet. Uh, interesting thing. Next. Okay, that finished. Next one. Long lost brother. So in the Midwest, you definitely know of Lewis and Clark 
uh, when these two men were traveling with uh, Saka Gavia, they ran into trouble. And uh, they needed horses from a nearby tribe. They were surprised that their guide, who was Saka Gavia, when he went to look uh, for the tribe, they found that the chief was Saka Gavia's long lost brother. Without that, they would not have succeeded in continuing. Interesting. Next one. A Civil War man, okay, Wilmer McLean, got a front row view of the two of the most important events in the Civil War. The first land battle happened essentially in his backyard. So to avoid the destruction, he moved some miles away to a cottage because it started in his backyard. So uh, he, to wait out the war, when the end came, Robert E. Lee himself showed up at the cottage to request its use as a formal place of surrender. The war started in his backyard, ended in his parlor. <laughs> coincidence? No. No coincidence. And I didn't put it inside here, but there was another one of uh, the soldier that died in, uh, uh, in the Second World War. And for some strange reason, you know, in U.S., when they bury, they bring the co soldiers when they bury, they got the tiny little white crosses and little things uh, in a special uh, burial place for soldiers. The first soldier who died was buried, and then many others. And the last soldier who died was also buried, and their, their memorial plate faced exactly one another. Coincidence? Now, all these are almost like prophetic signs, beginning and ending. So that one is also, they, they took the picture and they show you the name of the soldier, even, of the, of the Second World War. Continue, next one. Uh, this, one this one is a modern thing. Uh, Joanne Rivers made a joke about Beyonce the day before she fell in a coma. coma. Then Joanne died on Beyonce's birthday. <laughs> so... Uh, before she fell in a coma, she joked about her. So she died on her birthday. Interesting thing. This is a modern thing. Uh, this one you probably heard. Uh, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym McTucker. This is Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, he is the one who wrote Tarzan, in case you don't know him. Uh, so he wrote other books. And this was one of the books. And we look below. Uh, did Edgar Poe have a time machine? People think so, because the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym McTucket, the author, describes four sailors who survived the sinking of their ship. They were forced to eat a rather unfortunate cabin boy named Richard Parker. Although Poe claimed that the story was based on real events, that wasn't actually true. Forty-six years later, a boat really did sink. And the members of the crew were rescued, were forced to eat a cabin boy. 46 years later, okay. The cabin boy's name was Richard Parker. 46 years later, the story actually became true. So, what was happening? Resonance picked up 46 years before that time. Because when the author is writing, he opened his mind to the dimension, trying to have, you know, writers need flow. Then in the flow was this story. Where did the story come from? He picked it up from somewhere, from the dimension where all knowledge is stored. He wrote it 46 years before that incident, and it actually occurred. Next one is a Titanic, I think. Oh, no, no this, this lady is interesting. Miss Unsinkable. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is a, a true picture of her. Okay, depending on how you look at it, Violet Jessup was either one seriously lucky lady or she was one seriously bad woman. <laughs> the stewardess and nurse was on the HMS Olympic. When it struck HMS Hawk, she was on board. The HMS Britannic, when it sank after he... She, uh, so, when it, when it struck, she was safe. Then there's this second incident. She was on board HMHS Britannic. It sank hitting a sea mine. And she's also safe. Then she was also on RMS Titanic. 
when it hit the iceberg, she also was one of those saved. So they say, what, three times, huh? And the ship struck. She, she cannot sink. Means unsinkable. Next one, I think, is the Titanic. Or not yet. These Dutch cyclists will escape two plane crashes. These are new, uh, recent ones. So these are men here. Now next, down the story. Dutch cyclist Maarten de Jong has escaped not one but two major plane crashes. He was supposed to be on board missing Malaysian airline flight 370 before deciding to take a flight that departed one hour earlier and he was safe. He was also supposed to fly to fly on Malaysian airline flight 17. <laughs> the one that was shot down over Ukraine in 2014 before changing to a different flight to save the money. So, he escaped both, twice. Interesting, eh? Angels at work. Okay, next one. The man who predicted the sinking of the Titanic, he didn't actually predict. He wrote a book. And the book was the futility in the wreck of the Titan. The Titan, which is the name of a ship. Exactly like the Titanic. And this is the man, this is the author. What is his name? Morgan Robertson. 14 years before the Titanic sank, in 1898, Morgan Rob Robertson, a fantasy writer from the US, wrote about a ship sinking in a novella called Futility. The ship, uh, futi there's a no, no. The ship in the book was called the Titan. But that's not the end of the similarities. For example, like the real Titanic, the Titan was described as unsinkable. They also both had insufficient lifeboats. And they both collided with icebergs in the North Atlantic. And this 14 years before the Titanic actually happened. Coincidence? Something is there. Of course, we authors, they pick up some knowledge from somewhere. And uh, so, I think this is the last one, right? On that side. There's nothing else, I think. We are right at the end. Okay, thank you. Now, let me see on my side whether I have anything on. Uh, no, nope. uh, that is what I wanted to cover. All right, the next one. So, on, on the coincidences, I mentioned resonance. Resonance of DNA from twins. Uh, and then I mentioned of uh, uh, picking up knowledge, knowledge that flow from the ether, or the flow of knowledge that is there, that is up there, knowledge of past, present, future, that can be picked up. And uh, then there is also occurrences of time travel and time sleep. And uh, I became interested in it when God told me about my own personal time travel. So, then I, I became more interested to look at that. So here are people who seem to have entered a phase of time. Now, as I describe it, I want to remind you that I've been transported on uh, November 27, 2012, while in a car. Two other passengers were, were there. As we travel from uh, Sydney to Canberra, uh, just before Goulburn, about 11.59. I remember the last time check was 11.30. We don't always look at the time, but I remember last time was 11.30. The next time check was 12.30 after the transportation. And the GPS was off. And uh, so, but when I saw it in the spirit, the time was about 11.59 when the transport happened. And we were taken about 100 kilometers. And our, on, the angels explained to us how the transportation took place. The angels, because we were uh, 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 more on the scientific side, and the angel said, reality, our physical reality, is made up of frames. And so what they did is they took one frame and joined with another frame, so we flow straight into the other frame. What well, geography to them was just like joining two 
to uh, like you know in videotape you snip cut and then you join it and in between everything gone and uh, so it was then like joining one film to another film and so when you look at a film you just enter into this dimension here and so besides geography in a frame you also have frames that have been running from the story of human being have started from the time of Adam Adam and Eve so that reel of tape has been running so from time to time some frames intersect at certain times I will describe as I study these cases what was the environment in which such things happen so one of them was these two academics and uh, a lot remember on the internet there are a lot of false stories also but these are well researched and well documented ones two female academics Ileano Jordian and Charlotte Ann Mobley earlier she experienced a time slip and saw Marie Antoinette the Comte de Vaudreuil and some other people in the time of the French Revolution and uh, so their story I got the details one here okay the Mobley Jordan incident is well documented and so uh, so it describes both their background uh, the academics and this is what both women experienced. The two women decided to visit a palace Versailles as part of the trip. It was on 10 August 1901. And uh, they traveled by train to Versailles. They did not think much about the palace. Now it's just a tourist spot when they were visiting. So they decided to walk through the gardens to the Petit Trianon, must be a section of the palace. On the way, they reached a the Grand Trianon and found it was close to the public. They traveled with a Bedecker guidebook, but the two women soon became lost in the palace. After missing a turn in the main avenue, they passed this road and entered a lane where, unknown to them, they passed their destination. Mobley noticed a woman sh shaking a white cloth out of a window. Jordan noticed an old deserted farmhouse outside of which was an old plough. At this point, they, f they claimed they felt an oppression. A dreariness came over them. Then they saw some men who looked like palace gardeners who, who told them to go straight on. <coughs> told them to go straight, straight on. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, when they saw <coughs> when they saw this man the description was <coughs> when they saw this man they thought they were gardeners and they said they looked like very dignified officials dressed in long grayish green coats with small three-cornered hats. <coughs> Remember, this is very detailed. And they interacted with them. And uh, then they noticed a woman and a girl in the doorway. The woman was holding a jug to the girl. And uh, Jordan described it as a tableau vivant, a living picture, much like Madame Tussaud's wax house. Mombly did not notice a cottage, but felt the atmosphere change. She wrote, everything suddenly looked unnatural, therefore unpleasant. Even the trees seemed to be flat and lifeless, like wood work, like woodwork in tapestry. There were no effects of light and shade, and no wind stirred the trees. They reached the edge of a wood close to the Temple de Elmore, part of the palace. Came across a man seated beside a garden kiosk wearing a cloak and a large shady hat. According to Mobley, his appearance was most repulsive. His expression, odious. His complexion, dark and rough. Jordan noted the man slowly turned his face, which was marked by smallpox. 
His complexion was very dark. The expression was evil. Yet seeing, and though I did not feel that he was looking particularly at us, I felt a repugnance to go past him. <coughs> a man later described as tall with large dark eyes and crisp curling black hair under a large sombrero hat came up to them and showed them the way to the petite trier rod. Remember, somebody laid them out to another part of the garden. After crossing a bridge, they reached the gardens in front of the palace and mobilely noticed a lady sketching on the grass to look at them. She later described what she saw in great detail. The lady was wearing a light summer dress. On her head was a shady white hat. She had lots of fair hair. <coughs> Mobili thought she was a tourist at first. But the dress appeared to be old-fashioned. Mobili came to believe that the lady was Maria Antoniette. Ah, oh, thank you very much. So, oh, nice. Mm -hmm. So, what happened here? I believe they passed through a frame in time. And in that frame in time, um, they enter into seeing things in the past. And what they saw was probably the effect of the, and the evil that was there, that they sense, and the person who let them out was either a real person working as an angel that brought them out of that frame. But they accidentally stepped into a frame in the past while visiting history. And this is a true account that is there. And what, another account that I didn't put in because uh, it, it, it was more like a story in a story in a story, uh, was about a man who appear. I think it was appear in a, uh, in a modern uh, 20th century, 19 something. Then uh, the man appeared in the middle of the street, and uh, he looked confused. But his clothes were like from 18 something, 1846 in the end. And uh, when they uh, when he he appeared very dazed, and then he was knocked down and killed. When they traced, they found some things on him that belonged to 1846. And then his name was there, and they checked there's no person existing in 19-something. But they traced, and they found that in 1846, someone by the exact name disappeared in the area of New York. Uh, but that one I didn't put in, because not enough data for me. But let's look at the next one on this side, with interesting data. Whether you call it time slip or time portal. Now this is a true one. Because he recorded it, you know, as a army person, you record everything that you see. So, the time slip of Air Marshal Sir Robert Victor Goddard over the former Royal Air Force. And uh, so let's look on at the story. In 1935, while still a wing commander, he was sent to inspect a disused airfield. Remember, this is 1935. A place called Dram. He found it very dilapidated, state with cattle grazing on the grass. They had forced uh, through cracks in the tarmac. Later that day, he ran into trouble while flying his biplane in heavy rain, decided to fly back to Dram and get his bearings. As he approached the airfield, the torrent rain, torrential rain abruptly changed to bright sunlight. When he looked down, he saw the airfield had been completely renovated and was now in use. There were mechanics in blue overalls walking around and four yellow planes parked on the runway. One of these was a model which for, his, from, for his, all his aviation experience, he completely failed to recognize. And down there is a picture of it. Yellow color. Four years later, the RAF began to paint their planes yellow and the mechanics uniform was switched to blue. Now, the interesting thing is, I got some details here on Victor Godet. Okay, this was his experience. Uh, as he flew through, uh, what was the weather like? And this to me was interesting. 
1935, one day that year, he was flying to Edinburgh for uh, Andover, England. Uh, and while in his perfectly ordinary flight, he passed over a delipidated airfield in Dram, Scotland. The place had long been abandoned to the point where foliage had taken over. Uh, and it's all just a farm when he flew over it. And he continued his way until he reached his destination in Edinburgh. Few days later, he flew back. And Goddard began his trip back to Andover. He took the same route, which would lead him once again over Dram. So he could see over Dram. <clears throat> but before he could reach there, he ran to be into a peculiar storm. I call it peculiar because along with high winds and torrential rain, the storm clouds were yellow. It didn't take long for Goddard to become disoriented and lose control of his plane. In another story, it talked about more detail how he was going downwards and he had to regain control. <clears throat> he tried to regain control by climbing above the yellow clouds. But they seemed to have no end. Keep on climbing and no end to it. His plane began to fall. Fortunately for him, that's when an unexpected happened. The clouds broke and you could see the ground again. And there he saw Dram, the place called Dram. But when he approached, it was a different one. He saw that the storm had vanished, the sky turned bright and sunny, it stopped raining, everything became clear, but something was different. The airfield in Dram was no longer abandoned. Remember before they were cattle, cows and were farm. In fact, it looked good as new. He could see mechanics down there, uh, four planes, each planted yellow, set on the runway. One was a model he had never seen before, a monoplane unlike any in the Royal Air Force in 1935. And what were the mechanics wearing? Blue overalls. This, along with the yellow planes, Goddard found strangers of all. RAM mechanics in 1935 were brown overalls, not blue. And there were no yellow planes to his knowledge. Goddard didn't have much time to think about it, though, but he quickly flew on. And uh, by the time he passed over the airfield, the storm had suddenly returned. And the bright sunshine dissolved in the hard rain. And those strange yellow clouds engulfed him once more. Once again, he found himself battling to control his airplane. But this time he won and was able to land safely at his home base. When he landed, he couldn't help but tell his friends what happened. As you expect, he was met with skepticism. And afterward, he mostly kept the story to himself. He didn't want anyone to think he was crazy. But he later retold that story in his, uh, in his book. The final twist to this account, in 1939, that is four years later, the vision that Victor Godet saw at the Dram Airfield actually came to pass. The RAF began to paint their training planes yellow. The RAF and, and a new monoplane, the Magista, just like the one he witnessed in 1935. By that year, even the mechanics overalls had been updated to blue. So what did he saw? He went into the future, four years, and then he came back again. Just asleep in time. And he saw it. Since he was actually driving it, it's not a vision. He actually went into it and came out. Uh, just like the other story of the two ladies, the two academic ladies who went on a tour. And so, more time stories here. Let's look at this one. This one took place uh, in a different place, uh, caught in a temporal vortex. Dr. Paul Rios Santino, a medical doctor, investigated the paranormal, recounted the author Scott Corral's a story told to him by one of his patients. A 30-year-old woman who came to him with a serious case of hemiplegia, the total paralysis of one side of her body. And she told him, uh, I was at a campground in the vicinity of uh, Makahuasi. Well, I don't know all these places. Uh, this is in Peru. Maku Makahuasi is a famous stone forest located 35 miles east of Lima, Peru. I went out exploring late at night with some friends. Oddly enough, we heard the strains of music and noticed a small 
torch lit stone cabin. I was able to see people dancing inside. But upon getting closer, I felt a sudden sensation of cold, which I paid little attention to. And I struck my head into the door. It was then that I saw the occupants were clad in 17th century fashion. I tried to enter the room, but one of my girlfriends pulled me up. It was at that moment that half of the woman's body became paralyzed. Was it because a woman's friend pulled her out of the stone cabin that she half enter? Was her half her body caught in some temporal vortex? No one knows. EEG was able to show that the left hemisphere of the brain did not show signs of normal functioning, as well as an abnormal amount of electric waves. This is a doctor's account of one of the patients. So this woman might have half entered. I think she should have fully gone in and fully come out. But it seems that she got stuck. Now, if all reality on this planet is made up of frames, from time to time, there are energy flows that disrupt the frames. At points where the energy flow disrupts the flames, the, the frames, time slips can occur. And we only know of the ones that are reported. You don't know the ones that are not reported. And remember, this present earth is not in its perfect state. If there is perfection, these things will not happen. But because a frame is a frame is a frame of reality. And frames are made up of spiritual energy, physical energy, matrix of energies. They can be disrupted. Just as when we begin to travel from geography from one place to another in an instant, these are all frames. Thus, in this end time, the understanding of these frames of reality need to be fully understood so that we can travel through them. And so, these are occurrences that I want to point to the fact that it is already happening by accident. The question is, if it happens by accident, could it happen by choice? Transportation is happening by choice by the will of God and His angels? Then the question, if there's a will of God and a will of angels, can the enemy sometimes play around with those things? Just as we know, the enemy causes disasters also. You read in the book of Job, chapter 1, all those things that were happened to Job were natural events, but the source of it was from the devil. So, there's God, there's the enemy, and here's another one. Highway to the past, and uh, we go on this one. In October 1969, a man identified only as LC and his business associate Charlie were driving north from Ab Abbeville, Louisiana, toward Lafayette on Highway 167. As they were driving along the nearly empty road, it's usually always empty. When we were transported on November 27, 2012, the whole road in front and the back was empty. I mean, it would be terrible if the car was right behind us and we disappeared, right? But somehow, the environment was just nice, and phew, we are just in another place. And uh, so for them, empty road. And they began to overtake what appeared to be an empty car, traveling very slowly. The two men were impressed by the mean condition of the nearly 30-year-old car. It looked virtually new, and they were puzzled by its bright orange license plate, which was stamped only 1940. They figured, however, that the car must be part of an antique auto show. And as they passed a slow-moving vehicle, they slowed their car to get a good look at the old model. The driver of the old car, can we move upwards? The driver of the old car was a young woman dressed in vintage 1940s clothing. And her passenger was a small child likewise dressed. 
The woman seemed to panic when they saw their car over overtake and confused. Elsie asked if she needed help and through her roll-up window indicated yes. Elsie motioned for her to pull off to the side of the road. The businessman pulled ahead of the car and turned onto the shoulder of the road. When they got out and they looked, the old car had disappeared. Time slipped. That for a moment, the two frames could see each other. Then, suddenly, disappeared. Strange. Okay? And uh, this was so puzzled. And then, not only they saw, so it shows it's not just a vision. Because moments later, another car pulled up to the businessman and quite puzzled, said, uh, said to them, uh, uh, pull out there, and the old car, and they talked about the old car that he, they also saw. They now disappeared. Strange. Okay, another time slip story. Uh, this one is a future roadhouse. One night in 1972, four co-eds on Southern U Utah University were driving back to their dorm in Cedar City. After spending the day at a rodeo in Pisho, Nevada, it was about 10 p.m. The girls were eager to get back to their dorm before curfew. They're traveling along Highway 56, which has a reputation for being haunted, okay? Uh, a while after taking a fork, now you know you never have to be frightened of the enemy after last night's sermon, remember? That the only way you defeat the enemy is by actually coming face to face with them. And when, you, when you're willing to do that, and you're filled with the spirit, and filled with the, the word and, uh, and prayer, uh, the enemy will run. That's the only way. The, the devil will only let go when you confront him. And that's why I emphasize is the, the double pro, the double pros means to go forward. If you go, f go any other direction, left or right, he will have victory. If you, if, so the word stand, having done all stand, which next week we look at it on Thursday night, stand also involves moving forward. Each step, then the devil will retreat. A while after taking a fall on the road that turned to the north, the girls were surprised to see the black asphalt, asphalt had turned into a white cement road that eventually ended abruptly at a cliff face. They turned around and tried to find their way back to the highway, but soon became concerned about the unfamiliar landscape. And <clears throat> red canyon walls that gave way to open grain fields and pine trees, which they had never encountered before in the state. Feeling completely lost, the girls felt some comfort when they approached a roadhouse at a tavern. They pulled into the parking lot and one of the passengers poked their head out to the window to get directions from a few men coming out the window. But she screamed and ordered the driver to get out there fast. The girls sped off but realized they were being chased by men in strange three-view egg-shaped vehicles. Speeding again toward the canyon, the girls seemed to have lost their pursuers, found their way to the familiar desert highway, and they said, uh, the reason for their scream, the men said, didn't look human. What is that? Interesting. Okay, next one. Hotel time walk. Well, this one, they interacted with the past. Two British couples, vacation, remember, two couples, uh, in the north of France. So two men, two ladies in 1979 were driving, looking for a place to stay for the night. Along the way, they were struck by some signs that seemed to be very old-fashioned type of circus along the way, 1979. The first building they came to looked like it might be a motel. Now, in the more detailed story, they actually looked for several hotels to stay. In the end, this was the only one they found. And... Uh, so I believe it was in France or somewhere. So some men standing in front told the traveller it was an inn and the hotel could, not be, could be found down the road. Further on, they found an old-fashioned building marked Hotel. Inside, they discovered almost everything was made of heavy wood. There seemed to be no evidence of modern conveniences as phones. Their rooms had no lock. 
simple wooden latches, and the windows had wooden shutters but no glass. So, in the morning, uh, so they stayed in the hotel. They checked in, stayed in the hotel. And the price in the more detailed story, they found was very cheap. And uh, they ate breakfast, two, two people enter wearing old-fashioned cape uniform. After getting what turned out to be a very bad direction to Edwig Non from, the, from this guy, the, they paid a bill that came to only 19 francs, francs, and they left. After two weeks in Spain, the couples made a return trip to France and decided to again stay at an interesting place. Though odd, but very cheap hotel. How, however, the hotel could not be found. Remember, they stayed overnight in the past. And they were in the exact same spot. They saw the same circus poster, but the old hotel had vanished. And then the photos they take, I slowed down, move upwards, yeah. The photos taken at the hotel did not develop. And uh, the photos at the hotel did not develop, and a little research revealed that the French person wore uniform from 1905. That's 1979. They slipped into 1905, stayed one night, and then came up. And the next day they go back, uh, next time they went back, they couldn't find a place again. And uh, this one is of an air raid in 1932. A German newspaper reporter, J. Bernard Hutton, and his colleague photographer, this, they were assigned to do a story in Hamburg, Altona Shipyard. After being given a tour by a Shia executive, the two Nisroi men were leaving when they heard a drone or overhead aircraft. They at first thought it was a practice drill, but that notion was quickly dispelled when bombs began exploding all around. And a raw anti-aircraft gunfire filled the air. The sky quickly darkened and they were in the middle of full-blown air raid. They quickly got in their car and drove away from the Shia to Hamburg. Next one. As they left, the area, however, the sky seemed to brighten. They again found themselves in the calm, ordinary late afternoon. They looked back at the ship yet. There was no distraction. No bomb. No inferno. No aircraft in the sky. The photos Brent had taken during the attack showed nothing unusual. It wasn't until 1943 that the British Royal Air Force attacked and destroyed the shipyard in Germany. 11 years. Hutton and Brand experienced it 11 years earlier. So they slipped into the future at a very traumatic time and came back. Interesting. Why do such things occur? Uh, I think that's the last story, right? Okay. So why do these things occur? They occur because reality is made from frames. And the frame has been rolling from Adam and Eve through all our time into the future until the end of this age with the rapture and the tribulation and the millennium. I said the separation of some frames seems to be very thick, like the millennium is a totally different entrance. But in this reality, it seems that at high energy moments, frames intersect. And it's not like a it's not like a portal. Like in a movie we can keep going back. But it just happens. And there are reasons for that. And here are the reasons that the angels talked to me about that. They said the to join two frames together, there must be a harmonization between the two. When at a certain point, the individuals who go in and out of the frame and the environment they are surrounded with are similar and they can intersect. The two realities can intersect. It is Unusual, but it does happen, the angel said. 
there are those that are caused as a result of the accumulation of energy and there are those that are purposely done by the angels so far the enemy has not succeeded in moving people through frames but in the end time after the two fallen angels are released in 2027 reality will become a bit more fluid that's where they can change frames from uh, turn a tree into stone and they can turn the tree back into uh, real tree again. These are all playing with energies and frames of reality, dimensions uh, that do occur. It's just like when you join one song to another, if the song is in D, then you have to create a new composition to the song. You will most likely either, if you different chord, you got to modulate. Same chord, you could easily just bring it into. But when you join two songs together, it's just like leading worship. When you join two songs together, they are either slightly the same tempo. If they are different tempo, you have something in between to modulate, to slow down or speed up. So, reality is made up of frames. You need to understand that. In the Bible, you have Nahum. In Nahum chapter 2, in visions, he saw the future cars and roads. In Nahum chapter 2, verse 4, he says, The chariots rage in the streets. Remember, they don't have vocabulary like us. So a car will be a chariot to them. The chariots ra rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. That's a vision of a highway. So Nahum has seen glimpses of the future. And from time to time, and he will describe things from the past. Frames of reality. In this end time, we are coming to the place where we will have a resonance to be able to travel to frames of reality for transportation to take place. Frames of reality is, for example, in music you have all the chords in a, in, in, on music, in our modern music. Let's say, you know, from uh, A, you know, B, C, D, E, F, G. All the different chords plus their flats. So, let's say you are a G chord person. It's obvious that you would be only able to trans transpose and transport into G chord resonance. But if you have A to G, then you are more able to transport into different, different dimensions. That's a simple comparison that I'm showing here. And, um, and part of it that God is doing in this end time move is to enable all of us to have like, for example, a piano has 88 keys. And they do sell nowadays uh, synthesizers, also 88 keys. But they do sell the cheaper version, you know, the mini version, we can play just about two sets of keys. Uh, and it might have uh, just uh, a few keys. There's that, not a full piano key, 88 keys. And inside each one of us, is what I call uh, dimensions of reality and vibrations and energies. And all of us have a key signature and energy. Just like some of us, your voice range might go two, three, four chords. Some higher one go more chords. So through voice training, you expand your chords. And um, uh, the same way that uh, uh, in our DNA is being changed and transformed even as we wait in the presence of God even as we receive the Christ nature in us our DNA is being transformed but in the transformation of our DNA 
that is happening, there is a necessity for us to understand more about this transformation that takes place. So to understand more, may I ask this question? When Moses came down with his face shining like the sun, in a, it's a type of transfiguration coming down. Versus Jesus. Jesus Christ was transfigured in the New Testament. Is there a difference between the two? Yes or no? Moses' transfiguration and Jesus' transfiguration. It's different? Yeah, because the, the, with Moses, the, the, then he didn't, the light de deteriorated up at some time, right? It did not last, yes. And then with, the with Jesus, it's always there, but it was made visible to the disciples on the Mount of Olives. Uh, not the Mount, Mount of Transfiguration, it was a different mountain, not Mount of Olives. Mount of Transfiguration, it was in the north side of Israel. And um, the other thing is that when you look carefully at those verses in the book of Exodus, in the book of Exodus, and that's when God asked him to go up again, which um, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 33, when he says, please show me your glory, and then Exodus 34, he goes up to God, and the covenant was renewed in Exodus 34, after God spoke to him. It says in chapter 34, verse 29, Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand. When he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. When Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. And Moses called to them, and Aaron and all his rulers of the congregation returned to him. Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. <clears throat> when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Uh, whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off when he came out. So, the difference, one was a fading glory, and it was only on the skin of his face. Notice, it mentioned the skin of his face. And uh, when you compare it, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, let's look at the one in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Here's our Lord Jesus in his uh, transfiguration. <clears throat> and he called it the kingdom of God. They will see the kingdom of God. And this was what happened in verse 29 of Luke chapter 9. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease which he was about to accomplish. Of course, the disciples, they were all uh, sleepy, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men. They saw Elijah and Moses talking to Jesus. The first difference was Jesus' glory is always there, and he was increasing in glory. Moses was fading. Second difference, Moses was an outward glory. Jesus' glory came from his very being. Every cell in his body was glowing. Thirdly, Moses' glory did not affect the clothing on him. The cloth that covered him could cover the glory. For Jesus, the clothing was also radiating. Didn't they say his garment? There was no clothing that could cover the glory. If they had taken a cloth to cover Jesus, that cloth also would radiate. 
Can you see there's something else in Jesus' glory that was shining? And what Jesus experienced is for all believers in these end times. In this end time, the glorious church. Remember, the transfiguration, the glorious church will be transfigured. Because the transfiguration is the kingdom of God. Remember he said, there are some standing here who will see the kingdom of God. In Matthew, it's called the kingdom of heaven. They will see the kingdom of God come. Later, people, Peter, in his epistle, referred to this incident as, we've seen the kingdom. We've seen the kingdom. And I want you to know that that kingdom, although it began inside all their hearts when they were born again, that was the beginning of the Christianity when the Holy Spirit came. The kingdom began in their heart. And the kingdom become physical in the day of the ten toes and the ten horn. Remember, in the book of Daniel, Daniel, uh, you look at Nebuchadnezzar's dream first before the ten horns. The interpretation of dream in Daniel chapter uh, 2 And this was the interpretation of the kingdom of God. Remember, the transfiguration equals the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you will see the kingdom. It will prepare us. And it says here in, um, in Daniel's interpretation, why right after after the, he talked about the ten toes. Here he is, the ten toes. And uh, as you saw, the iron mixed with the ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of man. And this refers to the ten toes, eh, the toes of the feet. And in the days of these kings, the ten toes, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Can you see that? It's a prophecy that it began when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. But that Holy Spirit had been working inside the church, the bride, preparing, and it's still inside us. But in the days of the ten toes or the ten horns, the kingdom is set up. It will become spirit. It began in the spirit. Then it started affecting our soul through the teaching. And to raise a higher teaching, God raised a man called Paul, who received revelations beyond what the twelve apostles saw. So the revelations build a soul. As a soul is built, it reached the end time when we have revelations. We need to understand the revelations of the spirit, revelations of the soul. And in this end time, about the body. Because the kingdom of God being set up is talking about the body of Christ becoming glorified. Which is our spirit, soul and bodies. Which will take place in this end time. In the time of the ten toes. The saints will rise up to possess the kingdom. And that's this end time move. That's why the glory of God started coming from Pergamos. That's why for 3,000 years, you know 3,000 years that means that even in Jesus' time, Pergamos was still under the devil. Because Jesus came and died and lived and resurrected 2,000 years ago. 3,000 years! Pergamos was under darkness. Until Paul was asked to set up a church there, and you read in church history what happened. Martyrdom. Until on February the 9th, 2012, the glory began. It's a sign that it's time for the ten 
in the time of the ten horns and the ten toes, the kingdom of God is now ready to be set up. Angels are blowing the trumpet as I speak. They're waiting for the trumpet for this to go for. Although they've been blowing the trumpet since Fe February the 9th, 2012. Because this revelation is for us today. The scripture has already come to pass. We are moving into this. And everyone who has heard this word, spread it forth. It is time that God set up the kingdom. If you point out to them, what is the kingdom? Jesus had to give a pattern. He was the pattern at transfiguration. It's time for the transfiguration of your physical body. It's time to do the works that Jesus did. Now, here's the thing. When Jesus did all his works and the Father dwelt in him, wasn't his body sinless, pure, and holy? Correct. When we reach the same level of Jesus' spirit, soul, and body, then we will do the works of Jesus and the greater works of Jesus. The reason why we cannot do the works of Jesus and greater works of Jesus is because we might be similar to Jesus in the spirit. We are born of his spirit. We might be similar to Jesus in some way of the soul, although that's a large claim because most of the time, most people's soul are not that close to Jesus' soul. But let's give the benefit of doubt. Let's say the soul is like Jesus. But if your body is still not like Jesus, without sin nature, you go only 66.66666%. Because it's spirit, soul, and body. Can you see that? And all the energy of God flow through Jesus' body. What did they touch? His body, his clothes. What were they touched by? His hands, his feet. It came from his body. Although he was a spirit and a soul, it flowed through his body. And Paul says in Romans 7, Sin nature is in your body. And it says when you were born again, the Holy Spirit came into your body to mortify sin nature. But mortify is not enough. In the same chapter 8, he talked about the manifestation of the sons of God. And the manifestation of the sons of God is that sin nature in your body is completely removed and annihilated replaced by the DNA of Jesus. And then we will see the same works of Jesus with 100% healing. And everyone who come healed, because you come into contact with perfection. Now you come in contact with men and women of God, you come into contact with the anointing on their life and certain percentage of percent perfection. The sin nature in your body is modified, but not removed, eradicated. They do not take on the DNA of Jesus fully into the body yet. When they do, anyone who touch the body, imagine, if any one of us reach that stage, anyone who touch that body will of course be healed. Does the altar sanctify the goal or the goal sanctify the altar? The altar. You become the altar of God. Imagine, on the earth, having a body that is not a drop of sin nature inside. Because anyone who touched that body will be healed. That's why sometimes Jesus says, I will come and lay, lay hands on him. And then when the faith is greater, then... He says, okay, no need. Then you just receive my word as a Roman centurion wanted. Can you see scientifically where the actual difference is? The body. That is why in the days of the ten toes, God will start giving revelations and understanding of what 
this transformation is. Now, if we are fully like Jesus' spirit, soul, and body, then you will be ageless also. You will also never be sick. No virus there to touch you. They, of course, if they try, they die. Because you are immortality, walking immortality. Can you see the power of that? And can you see that that is what Jesus meant when he said, the kingdom of God has come. It has come in the spirit. <coughs> it comes in the soul. It will come in the body. I just grab a drink here. <coughs> All right, now. So, that's where it leads to the second part of this teaching. Say what? Well, part one, part two, yes. Part two. <coughs> Before we go to part two, shall we all rise? <coughs> and <coughs> sing a song. is about this transfiguration but you need to know a little bit of history of our physical bodies to understand this transfiguration of the DNA of Christ that can take place in your body where shall I start Lord all right scripture first right turn with me to Genesis chapter 6 Chapter 6, verse 4. <clears throat> it says there, They were giants on the earth in those days, the days of Noah. And also afterward, remember there's a word afterward. And that refers to two time, time zones. One is sometime after the flood. The other is in the tribulation time. In the tribulation time, especially the second half, we saw visions when giants, a king, come on the earth. But not as big as the former giants. They were giants again on the earth. When the sons of God and there's fallen angels, came into the daughters of man. They brought children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, and notice the word, men of renown. And that means that once upon a time, they ruled the earth. The only place they couldn't touch was the area around Noah. The rest of the earth, were under them. This was the rule of the giants. You have in the book of Enoch the names of 200 fallen angels who came down. Not all of them, but their main leaders. In uh, Enoch, 
chapter 6. Is this chapter, chapter 5, chapter 6? Yes, okay. This, is a, this book is in the old Roman numerals. Yes, chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, we don't have the book Enoch there, we have. Okay, I'll give you time to get it, but don't worry, take your time. And it says, It came to pass when the children of men had multiplied, and in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters, and the daughters and the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them, said to one another, Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. Samyaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then they swore together and bound themselves. Oh, we have it here? Yes. Okay. And they bind themselves by mutual execrations and... They will not change their intention by execute our project undertaking. Okay, I'll continue from reading this part. Next part. Then they saw, they bound themselves, and they descended, 200 of them descended upon Addis, on top of Ammon, and the mountain was called Ammon. And they saw upon it and bound themselves, and these are their names, of course. <laughs> so, they took wives, and then they began to approach, and they called the teaching them sorcery incantation, dividing of roots and trees. The women conceived brought forth giants and their stature was huge and tall. Some of them. They corrupted the seed of humans. It entered into the physical DNA of humans. And uh, <clears throat> so the flood came and God preserved human life. Because the whole, the rest of them all corrupted. Human DNA got corrupted. As it got corrupted, I'll talk more about that time afterward. And that time, the enemy is trying to bring back. But because of the glorious church, it's pushed to the tribulation. <coughs> and <coughs> God preserved eight souls. Noah and his three sons. After the flood, Human beings, you see the story of human beings multiplying and uh, then after some time humans begin again until it reach a horrible time again in Nimrod and just before Nimrod's time. Because <clears throat> chapter 9, Genesis, God made a covenant with Noah. Uh, <clears throat> Then the nation started, chapter 10. <coughs> These are all the nation. And uh, sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, in verse 2, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, Tiras, sons of Goma, and all those. <coughs> sons of Ham, all these countries. Cush begot Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one. <coughs> and on the earth, the whole earth, and uh, in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Karnelf. Remember, beginning of his kingdom. <coughs> and then he went to Assyria, he built all those, <coughs> and all these things. In the midst of all this kingdom being, and at a time around the time of the Tower of Babel, where Nimrod was actually strengthened by fallen angels, and as they built the tower there, and when God... God always destroyed what the fallen angels tried to do. See, when God destroyed the world, it was not just the sin of man alone. The sin of fallen angels. When they built the Tower of Babel, and, uh, and God saw in chapter 11, the whole earth was one language, one speech. Now, I want to talk about the earth when it was one language, one speech. And that was before, you know, and, uh, and coming to the time also when the days of Pelech, which was one of the descendants of Noah, the earth started becoming the drifting continents. But it took time, it was changing. 
And they were also, I saw in the spirit, meteorites that still were coming down. Uh, that keep shaking the earth. And all that took place after Noah was the earth was still changing. But it was such a significant event that man's lifespan became half after the days of Pelag. You can tell the lifespan. Before Noah, all 800, 900 something. After Noah, five, six hundred something. After the days of Pelag, became 200 something. So it began to be shortened. So the, the dispersal. But there was a time when the earth was one language and one speech. I want to talk about that time. Let me ask you this question. Ha! Ah. Important question, must drink water. Okay. Is Atlantis real? Is Atlantis real? Yes or no? Is real? It's a real place. Real place? Fable? Mythology? Real? Half real. Of course, stories might change. Just like giants were real, correct? In all over the earth, there are stories of giants. Look at the Greek stories of Titan, the, the Titans, and uh, all this. And in, in all the cultures of humans, they talk about once upon a time the earth had giants. What was it in the days of giants? In fact, Samyaza produced two giants. And uh, what were the giants like? How do we know that Atlantis was real? By asking the second question. Was Plato real? Plato the philosopher, 100%, history records him. Plato's teacher was Socrates. Plato's disciple was Aristotle. These are real Greek philosophers. Yes, uh, Socrates, uh, Plato. Plato, uh, we know more about Plato because he wrote a lot of material. Uh, and Aristotle. These are real Greek philosophers recorded by history in secular history too. And they know when they live, when they die. Plato, in his writings, wrote about Atlantis as a real place. A real place. And how it was judged and it was destroyed. I want you to know why it was destroyed. In Greek mythology, because <coughs> mythologies have half truth, half reality, in Greek mytholo uh, mythology, Atlantis was founded by, quote unquote, the gods. Atlantis was supposed to be founded by, uh, descended, uh, uh, founded by Atlas and another son. They were children of Poseidon. Poseidon was supposed to be one of the gods of the Greek. So in a way, Atlantis was the place where the infestation of giants started after the flood. All the stories of humans are one-sided, just like just like um, when the Antichrist comes, they will think he's a great man. When the false prophet comes, they think he's a great man also. They don't know the evil. All the stories of Atlantis talk about his advanced knowledge and all those things. Well, just want you to know that where all the knowledge and a lot of these things came from were fallen angels. And it says here in uh, the book of Enoch, chapter 8, verse uh, 1 onwards. And Azazel, which is the other fallen angels, 
chapter 8, verse 1, yes. And Azazel, and this is the other fallen angel that will come back, the two that come back in 2027, taught men to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates, fabrication of mirrors, workmanship, bracelet, ornament, the use of pain, etc., 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 imparting increased fornication, multiplied, they transgressed, corrupted all their ways. Now, this is an episode of human history also. And that history is during the time of Atlantis, when it ruled the world. And uh, Emma Zarek taught all the sorcerers, dividers of roots means they manipulated DNA. And then they taught the uh, solution of sorcery, bakayel, observation of stars, astronomy. Uh, Akibil taught science, continue. Remember the descendant of Amon? And um, did we pass the footnote set? Oops. Oh, no, 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 too far. Uh, oh, there, there are some more things there. Uh, I just missed it up. Oh, there's Amar Amar text, yeah, flash. Uh, okay. Let me check on this. Uh, two versions. Verse 3, yes, Sam Yaza taught enchantments, root cuttings. The names seem to... Yeah, that's correct. Only three verses there. And um, let's see. There's one more part here. Uh, okay. Look at verse 1 carefully. Make known the translation looks a bit different. Uh, fabrication of mirror. Okay, this translation is not as good as here. The old one actually says, uh, Azazel taught men to make swords, knives, shields, breastplate. Make known to them the metals of the earth. Don't have. Not inside here. The word fabrication of mirror. It's not just mirrors. It says here, taught them how to use metals how to use metals, and the art of working them, metallurgy. Uh, and uh, Atlantis was actually a place where the giants infested again. And they were huge. It was the second infestation of giants. And, uh, and that's why God destroyed it. At one time, when the earth was one earth, and one language, and one speech, they slip in. And that is how, you know how we know they slip in? Because some of their descendants, well, Semyaza has two sons, uh, two giant sons. And then they, they, they will die. And then... Uh, and in the Greek story, it's Poseidon, and, uh, and all, all those things. And, uh, but then there was another infestation, and that was Atlantis was one, one section. According to the Greek mythology, there was Poseidon, got two sons. One of them uh, went towards near the Middle East. One of them was in Atlantis. Uh, Atlas founded Atlantis. And in uh, Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, can you see these words? Numbers 13, verse 33. Then we saw the giants, which is the same Hebrew word, as you know that they like to use in the New Age, the Nephilim. Nephilim. And brackets, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants. Can you see that? See, but I thought all of them were destroyed in a flood. That's how the Bible said it afterwards. Afterwards, they came again. And human history records it as the Atlantis history. They were good at building pyramids, 
and big stone structures. They were involved in the building of many of the archaeological discovered pyramids and huge stone structures that humans couldn't explain who carried them. From one end of the earth to the other. And so you know that the sons of Enoch were descendants from the giants. That means that by the time the Israelites reached the land of Canaan, the giants had spread to that area or left over. Now, when the giants came, the land of the earth was still in a state of flux and Pangea. Okay, let me get rid of God that. Don't need that anymore. Pangea. Once the earth was one land mass, and this little diagram, let's see. Wow, so small. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you can see, it showed the land moving. Can you see the land moving from one piece? And uh, in all these different sections. Okay, go back. And uh, here's another diagram. Ah, oh, this is better. Okay. So you have roughly one piece of earth after the flood. It will already started to move. Started to separate before it became, can you see, it became more separated under our modern world here. Now, although the separation in, in most uh, of the signs, they put it in millions of years, it took place very fast. We will touch more on that in next Friday and the following Fridays as we explore this and tie it to, to explain this. The millions of years are based on either carbon-14, uranium, or different measurements of radio, radioactivity. And, uh, so, but there are some, what I call, they have a word for it, uh, out-of-place archaeology, which means it doesn't fit into the whole story of the history of mankind. And uh, so there's a lot out-of-place archaeology they are showing all these state areas. So Pangea moved from here to here to here to here to our modern time. Somewhere about here, when it was about this shape, this is the closest, not exactly as it is, but close to it. Actually, uh, uh, it was more, this part was more, I, I could not find a map that was the exact Pangea I saw in vision. None of them had the right picture. So, uh, it was more, uh, a bit closer to this, and Africa was more turned, and then uh, the European sector, which is, this sector was more formed, and there's a place where this one was an island before uh, it was pushed in further to become a landmass. You can see this was an island here, and uh, so suddenly you come like that, and that that's a, a, this, like, like this part, this became Australia and all this form. So this is not, not a very good, what I call like one, two, three, four, there's a, there's a, uh, it doesn't actually happen like that. And um, uh, it was more closer to this one becoming an island in itself. And um, so, let me show you here. Where were the 10 possible locations of Atlantis today, in theory? Some people say, is at Azores, Sahara, Malta, Bimini, South America, Antarctica, Canaries, North Sea, Middle East, uh, Terra, and Crete. Can you see all the theories? Trying to place where, where Atlantis is. But the best description of Atlantis and its position was in Plato's writing. In Plato's writing, the closest description came near towards where, near where the Middle East because of its proximity to the Greece. That's where in, uh, there was a war between them. Now when you travel worldwide and you look at archaeology worldwide, when they went all over the world, 
They always find in, in Plato's description of Atlantis, he describes uh, how it was built, the city and its capital was built in concentric circles. Like this. These are like the old pictures. And all over the world, from Stone Age to the Maya temples, to the pyramids in South America, to undiscovered places and places where they find big frogs that sometimes they weigh 100 metric tons. They wonder, who can carry them all the way to uh, Easter Island giants? And uh, all over, all these worlds were ruled over by the giants with humans under them. And they all shared a common lineage and influence. And it was when the giants ruled from Atlantia with all their knowledge and methodology. And some of the things that were done require very modern inventions. They were also able to invent flying things, electricity, drills. It was like a modern, Atlant Atlantis was like a modern 20th and 21st century with even more knowledge than us. Plus, they were giants. They were giants. And that's an explanation that of all these things, everywhere they travel, they find this symbol. Because that is a picture of the capital of what Atlantis was. Described by Plato, how they build uh, <clears throat> in concentric circles and how they enter into the center. In architectural style, it was beyond what humans have done. Of course, when you imagine when the giants rule, you, some of you think that the giants, you know, they, when they come on the earth, they just pom 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 pom, eat thing, then the flood came, they died. No. M maybe the pre flood time. But when the second infestation came, civilization and men have developed even more. And they were still teaching, remember what they taught? They were the ones who invented swords, spears, metallurgy, All the things of modern technology were brought forth by the fallen angels. I show you in the book of Enoch. The craftsmanship, you know, blacksmith and all those. And we humans handled that, but they were giants. They were giants. They were men of renown. Men of renown. Both before the flood and after the flood. And it was under the tutorship that Nimrod was also able to build the Tower of Babel. We help from them. Because the giants also know now, okay, better, you know, uh, let the humans in and they, 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 but they had their influence. But by the Nimrod's time, Atlantis had already been destroyed. God destroyed the giants a second time. When they destroyed Atlantis. And so Nimrod did what he could, but Atlantis was ruling there and all over the world. In hidden places here and there, they will find this symbol in all the places. And this circular symbol is there. It was like a picture of Atlantis. And so they ruled the world during the time when, let me see, the picture was something like, like that. And when this section where Saudi Arabia is, uh, the this part, remember I show you the 10 possible places. At the moment, the closest candidate was this section here. It used to be an island by itself. 
and it fit the description because it was near Greece and near enough for them during the time to have some sort of trade and exchange. And uh, you look at the theory, there are 10 possible places. And uh, of course, uh, the, the, some of these people who, who have these um, theories of these are very extreme people and they go into some very weird doctrine. So don't go all the way because it's, it's like uh, uh, what I call take the meat, leave the bones. And there's more bones than meat. So don't go all the way there. But in some of them, when they compare it side by side with Plato's description of, of Atlantis, where it could be, and uh, where it's become, according to them, it sank underwater, and uh, then the earth continued to move before land appear and disappear again. So it was not like a smooth ta da 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 It was not like that. The earth was really in upheaval during that time. And uh, so far, when I look at all the possible places, the closest that have feet uh, nearest was where that uh, area of the Gulf is, Arabia, the area, before it became just one of the uh, continuation from the Asian continent. It used to be an island by itself in a drifting time. And that was in the time of giants. When God destroyed all the giants, when God destroyed all the giants, when Atlantis was destroyed, a lot of the giants were destroyed second time. God destroyed them. Some left over were the sons of Anak. And that's when Nimrod started rising. Nimrod started rising. And, but there were still the Canaanites that were there. The sons of Anak, which you saw in the Bible, brackets, were from the giants. Because when Atlantis was destroyed, some of the giants, or the descendants of giants, survived. They breed into mankind. They breed into mankind. And somewhere along the line, next week we'll talk more about that. The giants left over DNA with mankind is in the Neanderthal, Neanderthals. You know the Neanderthal? Uh, the Neanderthal, the race of humans, they were like giant bones. The hand of the Neanderthal is as big as your leg. So they're powerful, strong. And they found in human beings, they have a small percentage of Neanderthal DNA. Neanderthal DNA. And um, in the spread of Pangea, there's this chart here. Okay, let me get back out of this chart. There was a nice chart I saw. Oh, this one. When it was partly Pangea, okay, they found in archaeology, when this is how they know how to put it back together again. Because the fossil remains of this group are the same. And this group, green one, is a different type of fossil. This one is a different type of fossil, different type of fossil. So that's how they place the jigsaw puzzle together. Can you see how they put Pangea together? Because there's a continuity of the fossil, the link. And in all these lands, South America, Africa, uh, even parts of India, Antarctica, one day they'll find. And uh, hey, where's North America? <laughs> okay, say, hey, they missed out North America. Okay, they didn't put the explosion, but it's there. That's what I mean, they didn't put. I say, hey, North America is missing there. And uh, 
But anyway, these are where they've done a lot of digging and found uh, archaeology and all those things. That uh, they found pyramids and then they found a common denominator in their language that they use. Remember, the earth used to have one language, but that one language was not necessarily a good one. As you saw, it was a bad one. And the giants play a role in that. And that was why God destroyed Atlantis, which in the New Age and in a lot of different things, they're still trying to restore, trying to get back, quote-unquote, a civilization. But it was not a civilization that was godly. And um, at the same time, what is most concerning is the DNA that got mixed up with the human race. And when you, they analyze the human DNA today, there is the us, the homo sapien. Then they say there's a trace of Neanderthal DNA, which is like the giant group of humans. There's a, like homo sapien, and then Neanderthals. And then you have another group that they only found a few bones. Cannot find anything else. Danny Sovens. Danny Sovens. This is talking about our physical body. And you know why I'm talking about our physical body? Because according, and all these things are now like what I call the uh, DNA has been turned off, switched off. You know, DNA is like you know, four, four codes that are on and off, A, G, C, T and uh, can be turned on and off. And what happened as we approach the end times is more and more people will either become the seed of God or the seed of the devil, of the enemy. Now, being born again can start changing us. Remember, when the story of the wheat and the tares, it looks like there's a potential for people to be either. All humans today have free choice. God has completely with the Israelites. That's why God told them, don't you intermarry with the Canaanites. Now you know why God is so, so, so strict. Because there was some pollution from the giant seed. Maybe it could be a higher percentage, not sure. But God is saying, you cannot even intermarry with them. And God commanded them to totally destroy all the Canaanites. Not even leave one of them alive. Now you know why God asked them to do so. Because uh, the giants were living together with humans who were partly corrupted by the fallen angel. Remember, the sons of Anak will be the Canaanites. And you can imagine if they are there, you know, is there some link or interbreeding? I mean, giants are there, they could be in between giants. So God wanted all that seed destroyed, so it doesn't pollute. But for some reason, there might be traces here and there. Some of you worry. As you look across, are you, you, you got giant blood in you. <laughs> and then you'll be wondering, okay, if the giant DNA came from fallen angel, correct? That means fallen angel DNA. Ah! Don't be so judgmental. <laughs> By the grace of God, I believe that he has eradicated at least the manufacturing of giants. But trace elements, he can deal with. Because Jesus is stronger than anything. So, but this is happening in the end time, which I saw. Which I'm trying to describe both with science and with the word. I saw that humans actually become more and more distinct into two groups of people. It's like the wheat and the tares becoming clearer and clearer. Two different stock and two different breeds. 
Until God could say, there's the seed of the devil, this is the seed of God. I said, what? The end time is also like the time of, of Noah, where they distinguish that. When the fallen angels come back, Samyaza and Azazel, both of them have been doing DNA thing. And as you saw it, Samyaza is involved. And then Azazel in sorcery. And sorcery is like trying to manipulate the reality behind this reality, which is the frames. They are there. So we are entering a different time in 2027. We have these years to prepare. Two cycles of seven years in which we prepare and we grow into that which God has for us. And in the Bible, the language that is used in the book of John, now John talks about the Antichrist a lot also, but the language of John in John chapter 3, when he differentiate between the enemy and God, he says in verse 7 and 8 of 1 John chapter 3, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practice righteousness is righteous. Remember what Jesus says. A tree is good. A good tree produces good fruit. That's his Sermon on the Mount. A bad tree can never produce good fruit. Jesus said that. A good tree will always produce good fruit. In other words, goodness has to be in your DNA. And we are not just talking about your physical DNA alone, although it's important. It must be in your spiritual DNA. Then in your soul DNA, and it will affect your physical DNA. And don't, don't worry about, wow, giant blood, wow, Neanderthal thing. What is Benny Sovan? We'll solve that next week. <laughs> Too many things for one night. But the physical will always be subject to the spiritual. And the power of Christ is greater than all. But what is happening? Now I understand these angels with resonance. Remember I started with resonance? All DNA produce a resonance. You saw the resonance of twins that affect their thinking and decision making. And they affect their lives. And how coincidences can happen, I draw a little chart. Okay, let's have this chart now. Long time since I have a chart now. Pretend you have Coincidence can happen when reality is contained and not random. So in this square box, if everything is in this square box, anything I do to one side will affect the other side to maintain its balance. If it's made from energy, if the box is not made from drawing, but made from energy. If I do something on one side, something will be affected on this side. Because of its parallel reality. And scientists have, have found this. They found that if you feel itchy on, let's say, your left hand, and they tested it actually, it's a scientific test, that they scratch a person on the other hand. They found relief on that hand because of the balance and the connection still there. When something is made of energy or when something is in balance, that a shape is in balance, when you put something on one side, 
you need to put counterweight on that side. If not there, at least here. And what type of counterweight you put, as you all know, remember the long ago they measure the weighing thing? They move according to the other side. Now, where they move can change based on the weight they use. So the weight and the position changes. If they use lighter weight, they might need longer. If they use stronger weight, then they use small increments. If they use medium weight, they larger increments to measure that side on that weighing thing. So when a system is in balance, anything you do to one side, something is affect the other. It might, as I say, it might not be exactly opposite because it depends on many other factors and resonance. That is a simplified, simplified version for you to understand. But it might not be here because depending on how the system is, is being held together, it might be Maybe, let's say, if it's red color, it might be yellow color, or it could be weighed by, let's say, a blue color in, in this position, rather. Can I see that? But still related in a sort of straight line or in a circular way, depending on the internal forces that are going on. So in a closed system, coincidences happen because of resonance. The energy is bouncing of a closed system. Anything that you do to any section, like let's say if I come to you and this is a Jehuda's head, ears, nose, mouth, but if I keep doing things to his leg, of course his head will feel it, correct? His head will feel it. If he's a normal person, right? And of course he feels it. Right? Of course he feels it. Of course he feels it. <laughs> so, but I'm not hitting the head. Because the whole body is connected. So in a closed box system, coincidence happen. How? Let's say the closed box is based on a nominal flow of energy. Okay. Let's say, if all things are that energy level. But let's say it got overweight by a certain color in one section. It must have a counter reaction. Newton's law still work inside there. <laughs> With every action, there must be a reaction to balance. One of the laws of science is that energy cannot be destroyed. It passes from one form into another. That's how they can calculate things. That's how they can calculate subatomic particles. Because the subatomic particles decay. How do they know? By looking at the result of the decay. The gamma rays, the uh, electromagnetic waves, the energy left over. The thing disappeared. But it didn't disappear. It just changed in its energy form. That's why an electron can be excited. And then when it's, it's, it, it cools down, it releases light. So energy, when it absorbs light, it, it, get, it vibrates. It gets heated up. Then it releases a photon. Then it comes down to a calm state again. But the total energy is always equal. That's how. Spiritual energy is the same. But in this book, it contains spiritual energy, soul energy, and physical energy. So it's a more complex system than we realize. But in the complexity of the system, some things vibrate the same and has the same cause and effect. I use a color here. That this X is somewhere related to one X somewhere here because their vibrations are closest. In twins, their DNA is even closer. That's how they can test people's DNA and can tell you, you are the father. You're not the father. Some TV shows are like that. How? DNA. You cannot run from DNA. Because the DNA is very unique. But the thing about DNA is, siblings are quite close. 
So a DNA of the sibling need a closer examination in order to differentiate the siblings. And twins even more closer in your DNA. So in your total package of spirit, soul and body produce a resonance. So it's like a like a complicated things in the box. But it's a closed system in the box. But here's the thing. There are six boxes that produce this reality. Remember the cube? There are six boxes that produce this reality. So, there's a box that is underneath the present earth. And uh, then, I draw these boxes next to each other. Whatever, and these boxes are linked. They're all part of a cube. Together, they're all linked. As a cube that produces reality. So let's say, this is the present earth. I put P. There's the box underneath. Then, because God created the cube to do the will of God, and the struggle against the will of God. So that is the Old Testament. The revelation of God. God, in, God stepped into mankind's history and directed the history. Anything not in line with the will, and it go too much, the giants came. That happened in the Old Testament. Then, okay, wait, the other boxes. You got to get the other boxes. Then there is a box called the New Testament, which is the revelation of Christ. This one is special. Okay, better give it a different color. Because this box is preparing us for new heaven, new earth. Even though he has this present, he has one box preparing us for new heaven, new earth. There's a story in the New Testament. Then he has another box called the uh, things invisible so this is invisible this is the angelic realm invisible so this is like more the angel and spirit being realm then there is the things to come future then there is a the box above that is heaven that brings you to the other cube correct that is heaven father in heaven so all these are linked and they affect one another so what happened when the fallen angels in the invisible came into this present earth recorded in the history of the Old Testament which is against the God's history anything you do in one box affect all the other five boxes when this box does the wrong thing it affect here, it affect here, it affect here, try, affect here, affect here and then God will effect back and push it back to his will by his angel. So you can you see, I started with this one. But suddenly it has six boxes. This is a present earth. The old testament is like the old earth, your past. This is like Jesus revealed in our time, New Testament. Something new for the next uh, next change that God has to start building into here. That's heaven. That's the angel. That's the future. So the put, when the angels invaded in the Old Testament in Genesis six verse four and tried to change the DNA, God keep destroying it. And the story of Atlantis is not here. It's here because. It's, on, it's, it's in the Old Testament time, but it's not recorded. It's only like, long ago there were men of renown. That means they ruled the earth. And it was a civilization unlike any. A civilization of Atlantis ruling the earth, giants ruling over men. They did not do the same thing they did before Noah's flood. Because in Noah's flood, they literally eat up all the food and everything. But this time they build 
it differently. And they try to incorporate human beings into that. And uh, you know why the human beings like to make the head long, long? It is found not just in South America. You trace archaeology. It's found in every section of the world. They first found it in the Maya temples. Then they found it almost every place. And then when they look at all the skulls that were there, all, and humans got three plates that fuse together as you grow. So what happened is the human wrapped the human head and, and, then, and then it became elongated. But humans got three bone, three bone plates that hardened. You can see the shape. When they look at the skulls, they found suddenly one skull totally different plate. Don't look human. Eyes look different. And those are usually more giants or part of the giant seeds that are there. Why would human want to copy? Because to them, these are immortals. And humans think this is beautiful and they want to be like the immortals. So human adapted into the culture and even today in some in some uh, very primitive culture, head binding is part of their culture. Because the giants look humanoid, two eyes, two ears, one mouth, one nose, but their shapes, size, all slightly different from us. So these are the things that they are finding in what we call out of place architecture uh, archaeology OPT uh, uh, what? Uh, out of place OOP OOP archaeology and uh, these are uh, areas that reveal Atlantean influence of civilization when Atlantis was destroyed everything changed humans finally began to dominate. They, if, as long as they are around, humans couldn't dominate. And some humans copy, which is why the pyramids built by humans are not the same as those built by giants. Technologically, we did not understand some of their science in those days. So some of their science and knowledge went to Egypt, went to uh, South America, different place, and they found in some of these places where the rocks are as big, so big as 100 uh, metric tons, they found next to it, and in some of them, they found depressions that are built for pouring metal. Last time, based on our understanding of Stone Age culture, where can we think that they will have the power to melt metals. That takes high technology, especially if the melting point is 395 degrees centigrade. And they found that. They found places. And I, I hope to capture some of these things to, to, sh to show you in this series, that they found these things, and, uh, so, uh, and they found it in two separate places. One is an ancient city in South America, and one, I believe, somewhere on the Middle East side, uh, on the African side. And they say, how come the same, this thing seems to be built by the same culture? It was. It was. At a time when Pangea was still producing islands on the earth. Um, where is this thing here? Okay, this is Pangea, and uh, when I go back here, at a time, ah, uh, there it is. At a time when Pangea was before this stage, when it was still drifting, still drifting, and uh, this was like an island, this was an island almost breaking apart before they were pushed together, this was like an island, this was an island, this was a big continent by itself. And uh, so these two are closer together. 
So not quite like this. I haven't seen a panja that is exactly the position that I saw in the vision. And um, uh, this part is supposed to be more inside here. And uh, before it twists in that, that way. So this island is supposed to be somewhere inside here before these two came close together. So it's like, like this. Imagine this modern one with this one as an island. And this is an island. And there's Europe more developed where the Greek culture is there. So that's where Plato can talk about them and there. And then Plato heard all the knowledge from Egypt. And that's where Egypt, Egypt is near here. And that's why from here, when it was... It was, at one time, it was under the sea before it rise up again. It was, uh, it was placed. Uh, some of them got displaced into Israel, you know, the Israel sector, before the land came together here. And you know where Israel is, right? So, uh, so uh, the story of uh, Israel, Egypt, uh, there is there in the world map, and uh, so. They have found the most important thing is confirmed by archaeology. And archaeology is still in its process of describing more and more things. And this is going to happen in these end times. They will discover things and here the world will move towards that. The people who do not know God will move more and more to favor the aliens and giants. They will begin to go into that direction. They don't know this, these are giants. But they will want to go back. And I saw in, in, in a lot of the, my research, I saw in forbidden archaeology, out of place archaeology, and all this, and these are real things that I will bring during this whole series on end time mysteries, that they are beginning to propagate a doctrine that we came and we came from Orion and we descended from the gods. And you know why? All the pyramids and all the buildings are always built facing like, you know, uh, the north-south-east-west factor, but they're always facing Orion's belt. Orion is a group of stars. You know why? Because that's where the Satan came from. That's a direction before he came to this earth and make it his headquarters. So all the new age people say, oh, something there, something good there. Oh. No, they do not know the history of the Bible or the fallen angels. That's how the, when finally the, the angels reveal themselves and they begin to manifest while the Antichrist and false prophet will pretend to be humans, the fallen angels, as the time comes back to open vision, will review themselves as aliens to try to bring back human beings to the Atlantean time. So the time that we face of the deception is different from the tribulation period. In the tribulation period, the Antichrist will be revealed as a god, but not during our time after the rapture. So how will he deceive humans in our time? By trying to bring back a culture that was once lost, that suddenly is recovered when the two fallen angels start coming back again. And then, I believe it was, it was Colin who told me one day he had this dream of the Antichrist manipulating with DNA, correct? Because they're trying to get back the resonance of whatever percentage of giants in the blood of these people. You know that DNA can be... Human beings are playing with DNA, but fallen angels can manipulate it even better. And the Holy Spirit can even do it much better because it's the origin of all DNA. Which is why, as I was reading this passage again, from the book of 1 John. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Remember the word of this time. Because the world is dividing into light and, right and darkness. Until the de just as there is a manifestation of the sons of God, 
What do you think will be the other side? The manifestation of the sons of the devil. Until the humans who give their DNA to the enemy, so that they can possess demonic powers. They will be the uh, high priest of satanic worship, but under the guise of something good. And in the end, it will all come to the DNA change in the physical. We will be so changed until our DNA is like Christ. They'll be so changed until they're back to like the remnants of the giants. And when they reach that stage, this is what happened. They will cross a line where they cannot be safe. This is a world that we're going to face before the end. And the Bible is warning about this thing. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. His seed, and the word seed is the word sperma, which means your DNA, the DNA of Christ. The DNA of Christ is from the word where we get the word sperm. DNA of Christ, the seed of God, remains in him. And that prevents you from ever walking in sin for the rest of your life. Isn't that wonderful? The only reason that Christians fall into sin is because of sin nature in their body. When that is eradicated, you will sin no more. You will not even want to sin. It will be a body like Jesus without sin nature and Jesus it will be like the body of Jesus after his resurrection because he was different before his resurrection he has to come as a lamb and it says his seed remains the word remains is it is inside it abides it dwells in us his DNA is inside and it prevents him from ever sinning. So they say the word he cannot. Never has he used the word cannot in that sense. What do you mean he cannot sin? We always got free choice. But it's so strong in you that you never won. Until he used the word he cannot. Because he has been born of God. Now, we understood this to be born again, correct, of the spirit. But this is born of spirit, soul, and body. That's why it cannot. It affects your body. And then there's a contrast now. In this, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil, and he used the word, manifest, phaneros. Physically can see these are the end times that we face. When the Lord and His angels started showing me this, all I could say was, wow, wow. I mean, I mean we keep thinking that it will be like the 20th century. You know, we are just humans here, humans there, weakness of human. Say, no, those are actually... Whatever percentage of giants, blood in them, or DNA, the enemy. Because their spirit is already given to the devil. And their soul already got all the wrong teaching of the devil, the devil's doctrine. So it began to affect the DNA until they literally become children of the devil. While we literally become children of God. Wow. This... Mankind's situation is totally changed. And that is why things will be different after 2027, 2029. As we move into the third period. And more and more, like the Bible say, it will be like the days of Noah. You know what days of Noah are like? They are seed of the giants walking around. They are 
open visions of angels claiming to be from another galaxy, another star, which is what they're going to do. What will happen when human beings all have open vision as the sun rays become different? And as human beings begin to develop open vision, they say, wow, you know, they are, they are, they are, they are, not everyone is a human. And some of them will choose to be non, uh, to be like the non-human demons or fallen angels. Whereas the people of God will choose to be like Christ. So it will all be in the area. For funny Ross, the children of God and the children manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Then he talked about Cain and all that. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one. So we know that sin nature is in the body, correct? And you know, if Cain is of the wicked one, we know that somewhere along the line, Cain's descendants got mixed up with the seed of the giants. Noah was from Shem's line. Cain got his lineage. The book of Jesha mentioned that Mrs. Noah was from Cain's line. Shoot, part of it creep in. But Mrs. Noah was a fantastic woman. She was Noah's soulmate. Without, without her, the ark would not have been completed. She did a lot of administrative work. But, so, don't worry about, you know, the, the, the sin nature or the, Christ is able to subjugate that. But remember, it has to do with the yetza, and uh, which is in the spirit, in the, in the realm of the soul, the inner soul, which can affect the fourth generation, the other generation. Remember how that God told Joshua and his generation, not a single one of them were bad. They were all good people. But God said, I see the Yetzer. There's still that, that sin nature wants to come out. Then without proper teaching to suppress it, renew it, it will come out in four generations. So God says, I will have Moses prepare this song. So this song will help you to remember you need God. So of course, all the time, Sin nature has been like suppressed, 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 suppressed. But Jesus doesn't want to suppress it only. Jesus wants to cancel it in your body and remove it out from us. So from the day that the Holy Spirit came down, the operation already started. First in our spirits, then in our souls, and finally in the days of the ten toes, operation in our physical body. Hallelujah. We are privileged. The world is getting a dangerous place, but we are privileged to be able to be like Christ. And God has chosen that we be part of this end time move. So as you enter into prayer, you know this 40 day fast, renew your spirit, soul and body into the fullness of the DNA of Christ. All that can be received in this 40 day fast of the transformation, transfiguration, of the kingdom of God coming to your spirit, soul and body, let it be so in your life. Pray in tongues because it will affect your DNA. Meditate on the word because the word can become flesh. In the book of Proverbs, in Hebrews 4 verse 12, the word of God is living, full of life, like a two-edged sword, cutting and 
dividing between spirit and soul. When you see the word divide, means it starts causing your DNA change. And I'll talk about the seven spirits as, uh, on one of the Thursdays uh, before the Melchizedek died. That it has to do with changing you physically. The seven spirits are linked to all your endocrine system in your body. And it's your in endocrines in your uh, hippocampus, in your pituitary glands, that give a command to your DNA and your body. What to produce, what not to produce, that turn on and off your DNA, or the A, G, T, and C. And as it turns on and off, your DNA becomes permanently changed in a certain manner. And then God adds to that the DNA of Christ until we are changed 100% to the DNA of Christ. Spirit, soul, and body. So born again in spirit, soul, and body. How powerful is that? That God has designed it for us. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the times that we live in. We ask, O oh God, as we understand these things in the end time, that we will be transformed and changed. As we begin to understand the mysteries, mysteries that are unanswered by scholars, archaeologists. Even today, they do not know who built all these huge pyramids and temples. They don't realize it's the giants and their technology. Today, we have mastered some technologies and we don't realize that there was a time when, when a different civilization ruled the earth. Now, Father God, we thank you. It's time for the saints and the kingdom of God to rise. To rise, Father God, to the place that you call us to be. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for all that you have given to us. We pray that you continue to transform us into all that you want us to be, to change us into all the fullness of Christ. As we wait upon you, as we worship you, as we sit in your presence, as we behold the glory of our Lord Jesus, we are transformed into the same glory. From glory to glory, you're changing us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all arise together. Amen.